In this scene, we're going to create an energetic explosion using fast-moving, high-pressure particle sources and exposure effects. We'll combine high pressure with fast-moving particles to create the basis of our explosion. We'll see how using particles allows us to control the timing and shape of our explosion. We'll then create a collider for our whole scene for both particles and volume. Finally, we'll have our sim drive a tearing cloth simulation. All right, so we're going to be creating and testing an explosion in Exposure Effects. And what better scene to do that in than this sort of military style explosives test facility. Now you can see we've got these large objects here, these sort of large concrete tank traps. We're going to make those colliders later on. We've also got this rather precariously positioned fabric warning sign. And then we have our blast wall, something for our explosion to uh, butt up against and shape the explosion as well. Now, if I peek over this wall, you'll see that we have our explosive. And it's a classic looking fused cannonball. Maybe it's uh, being disposed of here, uh, but it's actually rigged already. And you can see we've got this these user data options. We've got a fuse start time and a fuse length of 60. If I hit play, you'll see it starts to count down and then explodes. And it, all the geometry just vanishes away. And this is gonna be the motivation for our exposure effects detonation. So we're gonna time it to match with this. And we have control over the time of that. You can see by this, this user data, I could set it to the immediately uh, start burning at frame zero and have it at a length of 60. So it'll detonate on frame 60. And we'll tie that in directly into our exposure effects sim. And if we just take a look at our scene a little bit wider, let's take a look at the wireframe of this and let's actually turn the materials off for now. And you can see it's a nice and simple scene, so it's nice and quick. Uh, and the textures are doing a lot of work to, to help us uh, add some detail. Now, the first thing we're gonna add is an XP system object. I want to keep our scene nice and tidy. We have lots of stuff in our scene and we we're, gonna have, we're gonna end up with multiple systems for some different things. We've already got one in here for the sparks here. And it's just a good practice to add a system object if you're going to have a complex scene. So up in our X particles menu and drop in the XP system object. Uh, let's turn our icon off and let's go and change the color to a nice danger red. We'll call this explosion. Oops, there we go. Explosion, delete our default emitter. And now let's add our exposure effects object. So of course the exposure effect object is in the dynamics null. Choose Dynamics, XP Exposure Effects, drop that in. And I want it to be a higher resolution, so I'm gonna drop the voxel size to 2.5. And I'm also gonna reduce the size of the overall container to begin with. We're gonna start with some medium size explosions, and then we'll move on to some much larger ones later on. But for now, we just need enough to encompass this sort of central area here and make sure it's sort of centered over our cannonball. Okay, so of course, now we've got the uh, the container to solve our exposure effects, we're gonna need a source. And to start with, let's just create an approximation of our cannonball. And we could use this geometry directly. However, I wanna have some real sort of deep control over the direction of our, our explosion. And we're gonna be using particle sources later on. And they're really gonna utilize the normals of our object to create our explosive uh, motion. So whilst this, object we could make a source it, it vanishes a bit quickly and maybe i want some lingering extra fuel so i'm going to create a proxy object for that and of course it's nice and easy for our our cannonball here it's a sphere let's put that in the emitters null actually uh, because it's a it's going to be a source for our exposure effects and if i want to transfer this i want to actually move this to the object here i want to move it to the center of our casing over here, I can actually use a command called transfer. So if you bring up your commander, shift C, and you grab transfer, and then you point at the object you want to transfer to, and you click, and immediately it transfers the PSR over to that object. Okay, so now we've got a good approximation of our cannonball. I can actually hide our cannonball. And what we do to make it a source, we simply right click, X particles tags, exposure effects source. Now if I hit play, we're getting the classic fuel and heat being added to our simulation. That's then burning. It's being solved by our exposure effects. We're getting that upward thrust, that buoyancy. Uh, we're getting some smoke generated from the fuel and heat mix. Now, 
One thing I want to note is that later on, I want to be testing different shapes and different geometries to use as sources so that we can get all sorts of different shaped explosions. So essentially shaped charges. And one thing when you start adding lots of different objects that you want to be sources, uh, I'll do, do so now, I'll add a cube for instance, um, is that we're going to need to add a, a, a source tag to them as well. So I could copy the source tag to that. I could add a torus. Let's throw that over here as well. And let's add the tag to that. Now, if I want to tweak the settings and I want the, the settings to all change at the same time, I'm going to have to go in and select all the tags. And maybe I want to add more curl. I want to add more pressure. And that's like, and that's done. However, it's quite unwieldy to keep having going, keep going in there and doing that. And then also maybe I want to deactivate these separately or hide them from the viewport. And it becomes quite tricky to manage all these. So there's a solution to that. And if we can create a solid permanent reference point for our tag, and then later on for our emitters, we're going to bypass this, this management issue here. So let's go to utilities tab and add an object called an XP join object. Now this is similar to the um, Cinema 4D connect object. Uh, it has a few extra features, which are really nice. So we're going to use that and the XP join allows us to put the tag on that. And then I can delete the other tags. And now if I just press play, obviously there's nothing in there, so it's not going to uh, emit anything. If I drag that in there, now it becomes a source. And likewise, I can drag the cube bin and then the torus. And now you can see that we have a really nice way to manage our, our sources and later on our particle emission sources. Okay, so uh, we're going to create some subfolders to tidy this up. So create a subfolder. I'm going to call this one inactive. And I'm going to call this XP join object uh, EFX sources. And what I, I'm going to hide the inactive one and the stuff we're not working with, the, po the polys we're not working with, I can just throw in there. And there you go. It keeps, us, it keeps everything nice and manageable and allows us to prototype nice and quick as well. So there we go. We're adding fuel. Uh, like I said, we're just doing our tr sort of classic explosion effect sim. However, it's not really looking like an explosion. And what is an explosion exactly? Well, of course, it's a huge expansion of gases. It's a very rapid and large expansion of gases due to a pressure buildup. Uh, in our case, we've got this cannonball, and you can imagine inside that cannonball you have a fuel, and then you have an oxidizer, usually atmospheric oxygen or something else, and then we have that fuse coming in, bringing the, uh, the explosives to a temperature, an ignition temperature. They then combine, they start reacting, generating more heat, which increases the pressure, this is all incredibly fast, of course. And then that pressure builds and builds and builds, and then it explodes out of our object. And then obviously the atmosphere is much lower pressure. So our gas can then fill that lower pressure air and we get this huge expansion and rapid expansion of gas. Now, of course, I mentioned pressure there. And of course, if we go to our exposure effect source tag, we have our pressure. In fact, let's reset that all to default. And you'll see our pressure value here. Now, if I put that to just a thousand, you'll see we get a larger amount of gas and it does expand out. However, it is um, expanding out, but like it's not a huge amount and it's not incredibly rapidly. We want it to be incredibly fast. So I'm going to actually make it even more. I'm going to make it 10,000. And you'll see now it's really, really rapidly expanding and we're getting a much larger amount of gas and uh properties being added to our voxels. Something to note here as well is that because we are adding this so rapidly, we might need to add more substeps to our simulation and we also might need to let our adaptive bounds grow larger faster. And the reason for that is obviously if we don't let our adaptive bounds grow fast enough, we won't allow our our it'll our explosion won't be able to solve properly. So go to the explosion of explosion effects object go down to the adaptive bounds and I'm just going to increase the size at which they're going to jump up each time and that just gives us a bit more space for our explosion to fill. Okay, so that's an easy one. Simulation tab and go down now to our sub steps and this is going to be where we can help our simulation actually increase its quality and what I'll do is I'll exaggerate this to start with. If you drop the CFL value, it essentially makes it uh, it gives us more sub steps in the eventual solve. So I'm going to decrease the CFL a bit 
and I'm going to really increase our accuracy and our accuracy is to do with our maximum pressure iterations and currently we're capping it quite high so it wouldn't it would only get to two pressure iterations if I increase that and we nudge frame by frame again you'll see that our fluid is getting way is seeing way fewer artifacts and our fluid is actually being able to solve properly we're getting more fuel later on instead of just a quick burn and, and, our, and our fuel sort of gets dissipated too quickly and there you go so we're getting this huge expansion and it's looking pretty cool now we can drop those later on in fact i'm going to drop our accuracy back down i don't think we need it to be quite as high however your simulation may vary and you might need to increase those parameters to be for it to be able to handle it and of course it will be slower to solve but it will be more accurate Okay, so we have the basics of an explosion from our piece of geometry here. And like I said, let's test out some different shapes for a second. Uh, let's go back to frame zero. Let's drop our cube in instead of our sphere and hide our sphere. Let's make this quite a long and thin cube or cubic object like so. And let's put it up at the top here. And there you go. You'll see that the pressure is moving away from the object, but we are getting a, a very different looking explosion. The shape is very different. And the cool thing about having this, this join object here for our source is that we can actually combine these. So uh, combine that with this torus perhaps and add that in like there. Let's see what happens. And you get a completely different explosion. You Obviously the torus is creating this kind of really strange toroidal pressure uh, area it's you, you can imagine there's no pressure on the inside but then the pressure gets pushed towards that center and then the the, the explosion gets pushed up so you can see we're shaping our explosion we're, we're painting our explosion using different geometry and different sources now at the moment uh, the detail level of our explosion is pretty low and we can increase that by increasing our vorticity and things like that so let's do that now so go to our Explosure Effects object, Simulation tab, Buoyancy, and inside the buoyancy we have controls, of course, for the buoyancy and also our vorticity and turbulence. So I'm gonna change, uh, whilst we're here, let's change the buoyancy stuff. Uh, I'm gonna change our smoke buoyancy to negative 70. I'm gonna make it really heavy. Now it's still gonna be carried by our high heat and our heat buoyancy, however, as it cools, it'll become quite dense and give us a sort of a downward motion. This encourages the vorticing and you get these really interesting looking uh, smoke solves. Let's, let's let that solve a second. Uh, it won't change too much, but you can see down here we're getting these trail. The, the smoke is sort of pulling itself down below the heat motion, the motion that the heat is generating. Okay, so let's actually look at the vorticity, which is what we were, we were going to look at. Now, if I increase it like severely let's go to 70 you'll see that once our simulation starts to solve we get a very good breakup of our of our explosion and we're adding more detail and this is actually looking pretty good except when it's really high like that it actually diffuses our simulation quite quickly as well so i'm going to calm that down a little bit more let's go down to 40 and i'm also going to increase our turbulence now let's just to compare let's play that again and you'll see here our the shape is remaining pretty uh, similar to the shape when we had no vo or lower vorticity. If I increase our turbulence, it's actually going to break up this shape even further. And you'll see after after a time, there we go. We're adding a lot more velocity in via our turbulence, a lot of random velocities. So you can imagine that's a lot of different energy, different velocities, and in an explosion, you have so many different. Uh, uh, extra velocities being added in you can imagine some of the fuel being fired out in different speeds different size chunks are flying through and so you want to to make a, an explosion look really natural you need to break up the shape somewhat and uh, exposure effects of course solves that really well even at default but we can add and encourage that using our geometry and our buoyancy settings here so I'm going to close that panel. We're done with that. Now, the other thing I want to do, I want to make sure that our heat and fuel are going to dissipate because we are, with our explosion here, we're currently constantly adding heat and fuel. In reality, our explosion would occur and then our heat and fuel would stop being added from that source object, from that cannonball or whatever it was. Let's actually go back to our sphere. So it's our cannonball. And let's go to the tag, explosion effect source tag. 
And what we'll do is we'll animate these down. So let's have a few frames at the beginning, like so. So it gets nice and, and large here. And then let's actually, oops, let's keyframe both heat and fuel. And then a little bit later on, we're going to drop that to zero, like so. And of course, we're going to want to also drop the pressure. I should have actually added a keyframe there. Let's go back, add 10,000 again. There we go. Um, something else to note is the fact that we're currently in solid mode on our source. So it's using the interior, uh, wherever the voxels are on the interior of our sphere here is where the data is added. Now, if we change it to surface, we'll actually get a much more even distribution of voxels around the outside. And because of the size of our, our sphere at this point, that'll actually be more voxels than are on the interior, vol vo uh, interior volume. When I hit play, you'll see we get a much more energetic explosion. And in fact, we were getting more artifacting there. If you check, can you see there, we get artifacting because uh, our pressure is so high. Now we could either go back to our simulation tab and make sure that our sub steps are covering this. So let's increase our accuracy. Let's decrease, decrease our CFL value. And even then it's not enough sub steps to solve this accurately. So we would actually need to increase both the minimum and maximum sub steps until we got a number that actually works and kept this sim in control. But that will also significantly increase our simulation times. And in this occasion, we can go back to the lower pressure and leave our uh, sub steps as they were to keep things nice and snappy. So we'll bring that down to 5,000 to make sure the keyframes are all updated as well hit play again and there we go it's a much more manageable explosion but we're getting all of that detail and all of that fuel being added and then we're animating down and now we're adding we're not no longer adding any pressure and there you go there's our resulting smoke moving away from our simulation just like a real explosion the source would not burn for that long it's burning in a very quick explosion uh, unless there's other other fuel sources of course that would detonate and then ignite themselves so we've been using our different shapes here to create different explosion shapes, but there is another way to do it. And that's actually to give some texture input or to vary the amount of he heat and fuel being added to our simulation via either a shader or a uh, texture. Now I'm going to use a, a material because I'm also going to use it for the particles later on. So let's create a new material. I'm just going to double click in our materials manager here. And I'm going to call this our effects source material there we go and in the color channel i'm going to add a noise go into that noise and i'm going to change it to a blistered turbulence just to kind of give it a, a, a natural breakup uh, let's give it a different seed and also let's uh, increase the clip so it's nice and contrasted there we go i want to make it nice and changeable on the surface here like so okay and now Let's apply that to our EFX sources join object because remember this is our consistent reference point. And oh, we have our materials off at the moment. So if I hit N and then Q, so if you go to options, that's this materials uh, toggle for our viewport. And you'll see we've got this material now added to our sphere. And all I need to do is I need to connect that up via this tag. And this will actually add some breakup and some variation to our explosion. Uh, well, to the fuel amount in our explosion, which actually really changes how it looks later on. And there we go. Uh, they animate back down and we've got that nice breakup of the fluid. Okay, so we've taken object sources to about as far as they can go. We've, we've animated their sliders to create that moment of the explosion and then animated them down to stop adding the fuel to our simulation. However, that's quite tricky to manage if we have to keep moving keyframes. We want to change the time of our explosion. It's going to get a bit problematic. So what is a really ideal source for an explosion is a particle source. So let's do that now. And in fact, let's uh, remove our exposure effect source tag from our EFX sources here. And I'm going to keep the EFX sources because like I said, we're going to emit from this. And let's create an emitter. So I'm going to select our material because I want to use that texture emission and I've got the EFX sources selected at the same time I can go up to the X particles menu open quick tools and you'll see we have this command here called emit from texture and there you go tool executed successfully 
and we've got this XP emitter and let's drag it in. In fact, let's just drag it in above our sources here. And you can see now when I play, you'll see that we get particles emitting from our EFX sources. And obviously they're, they're emitting constantly, which we don't want. So let's actually tweak those settings. Let's go to emission tab. Uh, and let's go to the emission type or mode is currently rate mode. Let's change it to shot. And let's just have it, uh, let's have it at a shot time of 10 frames. And we're gonna have it actually emit only a very few particles. To start with, we'll go for six, uh, sorry, 60. Uh, let's give it some randomization in the radius. In fact, let's make the radius really large and give it some randomization. And then the speed at which these are emitting, you can see, they're pretty slow at the moment for an explosion. However, for our testing purposes, I'm just gonna bump it a bit more and then we'll work on it later. Now, of course, when an explosion occurs, the fuel is all consumed very quickly and it'll actually reduce down as, as, it, as it moves on. It's not infinite, so we need to give these a finite life. To start with, we're just gonna input a life into them here and I'm gonna make it really short, maybe like six frames like so, and they vanish. Let's give it some variation, and there we go. Okay, so now we need to make this emitter an actual source. In fact, let's change the name of this. I'm gonna call this primary, because this is gonna be our primary explosion. And let's go to our extended data tab, and then physical data, and we need to initialize some parameters for exposure effects to see on our emitter, so on our particles. So I'm gonna add some temperature. I'm also gonna add some fuel, and then later on we'll vary that, but for now that's just gonna be the constant. And then of course to initialize this, to actually communicate with Explosion Effects that this is a source, we right click and add a source tag. As you can see, we've got all of these parameters at default and let's hit play and see what we actually get. And you'll see we get somewhat of an explosion and it looks pretty cool. And of course the particles are imparting their velocity via this velocity slider. If I drop that down to zero, they'll just become sort of trails. And that might be a look that you'll want from your explosions. But immediately you're seeing that you're getting this really interesting breakup and initialization of our explosion that then develops into a really nice cloud of smoke. And of course, because of the, because they die off, they, they no longer add that fuel to the simulation. And we can go to the tag again, the tag, and we can really drive that pressure up again. So we're gonna emulate that huge pressure increase. We can just start with 50 and let's work our way up. Let's go to 200, this will be quite dramatic. And there you go, this is what I'm after. I want the initial explosion to have this really bulbous look, like as in uh, the fuel is just at the very beginning of an explosion, you often see this quite spherical shape. It's fairly even to start with. However, then all the variable velocities come in and break up of the explosion. And now we're starting to see something very interesting. So this can be our main, and you can see the, the, the large amount of fuel we've got is creating this really nice smoke. Uh, so, so this is a great way to initialize our animation, our, our explosion. And we wanna do a few more things with this, with this particle source to really dial it in. Now, if I show our cannonball, and I show our scene as well, actually we can bring that back online like so. Uh, let's turn the textures off for now and view it like that. Now you can see we've got our explosion occurring. Uh, it's, it's occurring at a time that is obviously different to our cannonball. So let's actually work out a way of timing our explosion to match our cannonball explosion. So currently that's set to frame 30. Now if we dive into the Espresso tag of this cannonball, now don't worry, this looks a bit complicated. However, we don't actually need to dive, uh, need to utilize this, but we're gonna utilize the same principles. We have things here such as the fuse start length and the fuse, uh, sorry, the start time and the length can be added together to give us our detonation time. So that's exactly what we need for our emitter. We need a detonation time to drive the shot time in our emission tab. So our shot time there you see is 10. And I'm actually gonna make our duration uh, two frames just to kind of snagger it out a bit. And uh, the shot time is, like I said, is 10. Now let's add another, let's add a, a, an Espresso tag to our sources here, over here. I can just add it to the sources. It doesn't actually matter where we put it for now. So I'm gonna put it on our sources object. And then I'm gonna drag a few things in. I'm gonna drag the emitter in, of course. 
And then I'm going to drag our cannonball null. And let's right click and optimize those. And I'm going to bring the user data in from them. And so what I can do is I can select that and I can just drag that in like so. And there we go. And then also on the emitter, the, the parameter I want to drive is the shot time. So I'll drag that in as well. Now we need to get the detonation moment. So of course we need to add the fuse start and the fuse length time together. So let's go to math operators, add that in like so. And I'm gonna change the data type from real to time. And then we're gonna add those together like so. And then that's our shot time. So if I look at a results node as well, let's add that in and connect that up. And in fact, let's change that to time as well. You'll see that we know that our detonation time is gonna be at three seconds. And of course that's correct because our uh, fuse start is 30 and our fuse length is 60. If I make the start time zero, the trigger time is now at two seconds. And if we go back to our emitter, you'll see that our new shot time is 60. Let's actually uh, let that simulate. So we've got our, our moment and then there's our explosion. So now we've actually tied our explosion of our, our prop to our exposure effects sim just with a few simple nodes in the Expresso editor. So it's not as scary as it looks. And of course we could tidy that up and we are actually gonna be bringing in a secondary emitter to arrange the time for that. We're gonna have a little bit of a delay between the primary and secondary explosions and we're gonna utilize this. But for now, we're gonna focus again on our initial primary explosion. And we're gonna focus on actually modifying the particles that we have from this emitter because of course, in X particles, we can modify the particles with all sorts of different mechanisms. And particularly, I want to make sure that they have some gravity so that they actually have a, a downward force. So we can just simply add that in the modifiers here, motion modifiers and XP gravity. So now if I actually turn the exposure effects object off and we hit play now, oh, our explosion is happening later on. So let's actually make that happen. I'm going to make our explosion happen immediately just so it's nice and quick. There we go. And you'll see our particles now have a bit of an arc to them. So if I go frame by frame, you'll see they have a bit of an arc and they start falling down. To make that really clear, we can actually use a trail object to visualize the path of our particles. Now we're not gonna use the trail to render with, but I like to use them as a sort of a diagnostic tool uh, for our particles and just to check their motion. So I'm actually gonna drop an XP trail object in there, connect it up with our primary and then call this primary as well, just so that we can differentiate when we add another one. Hit play, and there you go. You, now we can see the arc, and I pause it. Uh, when I've got a still frame now, we've kind of got an idea of the motion, where they're going, and the effect that gravity is having on them. Okay, so now uh, I want to actually view the scale and radius of the particles. So I'm gonna go to the emitter itself, display tab, change it to circles, and then I'm gonna play again, and now we're getting a good idea of our particle size. Now they're really large at the moment, but what that's enabling us to do is add a lot of that pressure, a lot of that fuel to the simulation. If we go to our emission tab, you can see it's currently eight uh, with a variation of three. Now I could even increase that even more, like so, and we get these huge particles at the beginning. Now remember, we're only utilizing these to create that initial explosion, and if I actually turn our explosion effects object on right now. This will be quite a severe amount of pressure. There we go, it's looking quite cool. But you see the larger the particle, the more of that data that will be added to our simulation. So we may need to balance that out. We may, did, may need to actually drop that pressure. We also might want to reduce the effect of our um, velocity on our particles. So I'll do that now actually. I'm gonna drop it to 40% and I'm gonna hit play. You see, it's, it's still got the pressure, but it's not pushing it out quite as fast. That's looking nice. And I also want to fade this off. I don't want this effect to be so constant. Right now, they have a, this lifetime, this finite life set in the emission tab to six. And I want them to actually scale down over time and then eventually vanish. Now, currently we're setting the lifespan here. I actually want it to be dictated by the scale of the particle, the radius of the particle. So uh, there's the full lifespan. I'm gonna check that on. I'm gonna turn the explosion effects object off and now our particles will just keep existing. And in fact, they're going through the floor and they'll just keep persisting all the way along. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a, an XP scale modifier to scale these down over time. So go to our modifiers tab and then it's a control modifier and then we're looking for XP scale and then I don't want it to increase in scale. I want it to go negative. Now I want it to be really fast. So I'm going to say negative two to start with. Let's give it a variation and then let's hit play. And there you go. You can see our particles are shrinking down. And if I put our exposure effects back on, you'll see we get that massive pressure at the beginning and then we get these nice little trails at the end as our particles shrink down. And we still get that really beautiful uh, smoke from the end there as well. Okay, so that's actually getting more to where I want it to be. However, our particles are consistently, uh, sorry, are existing way beyond the point at which they're zero size and not adding any fluid to our simulation. So I wanna kill them off when they get to zero and we can do that simply with a question. So go to our XP emitter, go to the questions tab, add a question. And this is currently set to particle age. It's testing the particle age. Let's change it to radius, of course. And then if the radius equals zero, this is the, the question, if the radius equals zero, do this action. So add an action. And that's this action here, currently editor, editor display. I'm gonna change it from editor display to direct actions. And we're gonna have it change the life of the particles. And by default, that's set to kill the particles. Then we play again. And now our particles should have a finite life and they won't exist as long. Of course, those particles going through the floor, we'll deal with those when we get to the collisions. And that'll be in a moment. And as I play now, our particles are shrinking down and then they're dying off. And then they've done their job. They've added the velocity. They've added their um, motion to the simulation. And we don't need them anymore. So they've died off. Okay. So I mentioned earlier a secondary emission. Well, in an explosion like this, you often have sort of a slight variation in the time of the fuel and you also have debris that flies through the explosion at different speeds and actually creates these really interesting looking trails and sort of like missile trails almost from the object. So it's things like shrapnel and, and bits of the actual explosive. So what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this emitter. We're going to create a complete copy of it. We're going to change the seed a little bit just so it's a completely different emission. And then in this one, we're going to call it the secondary. Let's give it a different color just to differentiate it. Let's make it a yellow color. And let's also make the particle colors yellow, just so we can see that. And then everything else currently is at the same. Now, if I turn off our primary emitter for a second, and we just look at our secondary, this will behave almost exactly the same way. It's going to utilize the same functionality. Uh, sorry, the same uh, motion as the primary one. As you can see there, it has a different look because we've actually got uh, a different seed. So it, we're going to get a different explosion, a different emission. And there we go. So let's add a trail object for that one so we can really see and dial in the trail for that one because this is going to be really important now. So let's go to uh, this trail object here. Let's rename it secondary. I've just duplicated the other one. Drag that in there. And what I can do is I can actually color these. So I can go to the basic tab and then I can color them based on their, their emitters. So I can just pick like so and pick from the top one like so as well. And now when I uh, turn our exposure effects off, you can see the mix that we have here. And when I turn the primary one back on as well, you can see the mix we have. The two trails are indicating our particles. Okay, so currently their speeds are the same. Now I'm what I want to do is I want the First of all, I want the secondary particles to last longer and I want them to have a slightly smaller size and then I also want them to get further. So I essentially want them to be faster than the original particles. So I'm going to double that and I'm going to give them a really decent amount of variation and I'm going to drop the radius right down, something like so. And we could have the, the count at this high, that's fine. And let's just see what happens now. Let's play. Now, of course, because I've reduced the radius, they're being scaled down the same rate as the primary one, and we need to actually scale them down at a slower rate so they last longer, because that's what's dictating the age, remember. So I'm actually going to have to create a, another XP scale. Let's rename these. One is primary and one is secondary. Now, the best way to keep these from... Uh, Let's do secondary. Uh, to keep these from interfering with each other is to use groups. So we're going to add a group 
for each of these emitters. So go to select them both, go to the group tab, and we're just gonna go create and add groups. And you'll see based on the particles and the emitter, they've, they've created a new group. So this is the primary group. And then of course, our secondary group. And what we'll do with these is we'll be able to isolate which modifiers actually use these. So I'm gonna say all of these are gonna use a group. In fact, let's just set up so that the gravity is gonna affect both groups. And then the scale objects are gonna obviously affect their, uh, this one's the primary, so groups affected, primary, uh, respective groups, there we go. And now we can actually have separate control of the scale on each of these. So let's really lower the, the rate of change on the this secondary emitter. Go to our emission tab, make sure our life is not uh, finite. And there it is. And there we go. So you can see our yellow ones are existing much longer now. Gravity is still affecting them. But however, these are going to cause a, a trail through our initial explosion. So what we're going to do is this is currently emitting on the first frame. I'm going to give it an offset of two. So I'm going to make it happen just slightly after. So it's slightly delayed. And then it's got a duration of two. So that's working. Let's put our explosion effects back on. And this is the point where we're going to increase the size of our container. So let's go for 500 by 500 and then give it a bit more height as well. And let's hit play. Now, of course, if, if we fill this container up, it's going to solve much slower, but you're already seeing that this, these trails, these missiles, these secondary particles are creating a really classic explosion shape. Oops. And if I let that go again, there's going to be a point where, of course, they'll stop adding their velocities as they die off, and then it'll allow that fuel to mix. Uh, we're getting some happening already down there. And, of course, the more voxels that we are filling, the more pressure iterations, the more calculations there are. But as you can see, we're getting this really nice-looking particle fluid and explosion. Okay, so there we have our secondary emission to create those trails. We want that to... Um, have a constant offset from our primary emitter and like I said with the espresso in the last one let's go into that and this time let's add our secondary emitter and make sure the shot time is the thing that we're driving now we want this to be offset by a certain amount and if I go to our fused cannonball controls and on that I'm going to actually add another user data so let's add user data and you can see we've got these two here already and the data type is going to be time. So that gives us this frame. And I'm going to set it to a default of two. So it's always going to be an offset of two. And there we go. Secondary offset. And there we go. We have the data to be able to pass to our exposure effects. We just need to drag that onto that null. And then now we want to add the offset, the new offset to our our, our ignition time, so our detonation time. So we can just copy this math object because it's already set up for time. And then we have our overall detonation time and then our secondary offset added together to create our secondary uh, shot time. Okay, so once again, let's go back to our secondary emitter and you'll see the shot time is two. If I try and set that now, it'll always go back to two because it's being driven by that espresso. Let's go down here and actually set these offsets. So our secondary offset is at default of two. That's absolutely fine. And let's have our fuse start time at say frame 30. Fuse length is one second as well. So it's gonna basically, our detonation time is 30 plus 30, 60. And then the secondary will be 62. Let's check that. Go to our emitter and you'll see 62 is the shot time on that one, 60 on the primary. Okay, let's test that out. So let's hit play. You can see our you can see our fuse going down there, and then here we go. Here's our massive explosion now, and you can see this is really giving us a great shape of an explosion. And you can imagine this being debris moving at different speeds, and that's looking really nice. Now the speeds we're dealing with here are actually relatively slow for an explosion. Would you believe it? Um, a lot of explosions are uh, sort of. 8,000 meters per second, which is, you know, incredibly fast uh, in expansion. And then, of course, they hit the atmosphere and they do slow down. However, 
Um, our particles here are going around about 300 units per second, which is three meters per second, 150 meters per second. Uh, we could really increase that to that eight meters per second. Sorry, 8,000 meters per second is the real value. So we're never going to get near that. But let's increase the primary group speed. And let's increase our secondary group as well. We might need to compensate for them moving so fast and then have them decrease their life quicker as well. So there we go. You can see the, the speed of them now is really expanding our explosion. So you'd want to balance this out with the, the pressure amount in the tag, or we could increase this, uh, the decrease of scale. So let's do that. Let's go for a really rapid decrease in the scale of our primary particles, and then equally quite fast for our secondaries. So they're going to be existing momentarily. And they, you can see the random speed is really adding to that uh, breakup of our explosion here. So you can see by changing the speed of our particles now, changing the shape of our, um, changing the uh, rate at which they scale down, we've really got a lot of control over the look of our simulation. Now, one thing to note with the particle emissions is that we can actually use different shapes to emit them in different directions. So say we wanted our blast to go only in this direction on positive Z, we could grab a, say like a disc shape. Let's move that up and let's make it Z plus. So it's pointing positive Z. And so the polygons are all pointing positive Z. And then if we move it down to here and if we actually make it editable and we go to points mode, we can actually change it to sort of a conical shape. And now this basically turns it into a shaped charge and essentially the particles will move off their normals. So if we change it to like an inverse cone like that, essentially the particles are going to focus in. They're going to aim at some uh, at a point and they'll probably be focusing in around about here. So what that means is, is we'll get a really fine um, particle emission to this point here. And if we put that in our explosion effect sources and hide our inactive, that's all procedurally set up now. So that when I hit play and the explosion goes off, our particles now are firing off in that direction. So that's one of the huge advantages of using particles is that we can really direct our explosion. And that looks really awesome. Let's hit play again. Watch that again. And there we go. So that's smashing through there. So we've now got a system that is able to create an explosion at a specific time, a specific shape, and we can have it evolve. We can control the, the way it evolves in the explosion effects object itself inside the simulation tab. However, it's still missing one functionality and that is its ability to collide and interact with the scene objects. So what we need to, we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to need to turn these objects into explosion effects colliders. And similarly to our sources, it's gonna be convenient to create a solid object, a single object that we can bring all these together with and actually create one contiguous surface or volume that we can use as a collider to make it as efficient as possible. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna use an open VDB mesher. Go to our generators tab and drop in an open VDB mesher. And then we're basically gonna add all of these objects that we need to add. So the, the 3D objects in our scene. Now, we're gonna to have to go down and select those from down here in our scene hierarchy. So let's open and expand that up. And we can drag it in. So let's grab the posts the wall, which is this blast wall here, the plinth, which is actually what our object, our explosive is sat on. And then we need our, both our concrete traps and the instance of that. And there we go. Now you might not have seen anything particularly happening there, but if I hide our scenery, you'll see that we are actually meshing those. Now let's turn that back on. Uh, in fact, no, let's leave it off. And I'm gonna grab the ground object. I'm gonna create a duplicate because I'll show you something with the ground object, put it just next to our open VDB mesher. Now you can see here in our ground object that it is one polygon thick. If I go on the underside with the polygon selected, you'll see they're all blue. And what that means is, is that the uh, collider tag would need to be a, a non-solid tag. It would have to have the solid checkbox unchecked, similar to the sources when they're on an object. Um, however, that's not the most efficient way to do this. I want to actually bring everything together. So I, I want to create a solid ground object as well as uh, the solid objects here so they can all mesh together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simply cut this object down. In fact, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move the, the outer points in. I'm gonna scale it all down. 
like so. Bring it in nice and tight. There we go. And if you think about it, the blast wall is going to deflect, or hopefully it's going to deflect a lot of the explosion. So I can bring that in as well. And then if I hit F1 to go back to our perspective viewport, and now I want to give this some thickness. So I'm going to grab all of the polygons. So in polygon mode, all of the polygons, and then I'm going to actually use the extrude tool. So I'm going to hit extrude. And then I'm actually going to use a zero offset extrude. If I extrude by a certain amount, you'll see that the polygons in the middle there that have any angle to them or any change in normal actually kind of distort and we get these kind of weird effects. And we don't want to create these kind of pockets of volume and confuse our polygon reduction tool. So I'm going to create a zero offset extrude. So it's just exactly a duplicate of the top surface. And I'm just going to pull it down. And then of course, it's got some three dimension to it. It's still got that indent. And I'm going to get grab the scale. And I'm just going to hold shift until it's zero percent. You could also just go to the uh, coordinates manager here and just hit apply and it would do the same. And I just want to make sure I include all of those objects, reverse our normals, and now we can include this in our open VDB mesh. In fact, I can actually drop it directly inside and it'll become a, uh, become a source for that. And there we go. You can see we've got our continuous surface. Now it's a little bit soft at the moment. You can see it's quite low res and we're not getting much detail from the sharper edges here. So I'm going to increase the resolution. I'm going to drop it all the way down to two. And now we're getting a better representation of our surface again. It doesn't have to be perfect, but if it's a little closer, it will help when I go to the poly polygon reduction. Okay, so we're happy with that. Let's right click it and go current state to object. So now we have a resulting mesh and we can turn this one off and we can hide it from our scene. And we can, we can always come back to that if we ever needed to. And I'm going to call this one the uh, collider, or oh, it's the scene collider. So it's all the objects in the scene. So scene collider, like so. And as you can see in our viewport, we've got the polygon count readout. It's currently nearly 160,000 polygons, which is very excessive for our purposes. We don't need it to be nearly that many, and it would also create a long time for it to solve. So we're going to drop this in a polygon reduction tool. I'm going to open this, uh, the object menu here, and it's actually a polygon reduction object, I should say. So hold Alt whilst we've got our scene collider selected and drop in our polygon reduction tool as the parent. And you'll see it begins to solve. It'll tell you in the bottom left there, our 470 odd uh, ver uh, triangles is, are now being reduced. And there we go. We can see a much uh, lower res mesh but we can really go low on this. Currently it's, it's sort of uh, 32,000 polys. I can actually drop it all the way down. I mean, we could even go down to as low as a thousand. And you're seeing, there we are seeing a, still a good representation of our posts there. It's maintained that detail. It's got the general shape of the floor and that blast, um, blast wall as well. And that's great. So now we've got an incredibly low polygon uh, object, a scene collider. I'm going to make that editable and I'll, I'm actually going to bring that up into our, our sources or our emitters up here. And I'm going to add the collider tags to this. So, of course, to make it an e exposure effects collider, it needs an X particles tag called XP exposure effects collider. And also we want to make it a particle collider like so, because of course we've got these two emitters and we want our particles to bounce off these if, they, if they're going towards them. So we can't actually emit any fluid inside. So I'm going to hide our scene collider for now and let's show our scenery. And we can actually turn the, the materials back on. And now let's go back to our spherical emission. I think it would look better here. So drop our sphere in the sources. And you can see how convenient that uh, XP join setup is. We can just uh, swap out our, our meshes at will. Let's hit play and you'll see our simulation is a lot slower because of course we've added a lot more data inside the voxels. However, it's not too bad and we should actually make the explosion time a little bit earlier just so we can iterate quicker. So I'm, I'm going to make the fuse start and then the fuse length is only going to be 10. So we're going to actually detonate on frame 10. So let that go. And we should see our explosion occurring. And it's colliding now with our scene bouncing off objects, 
getting all sorts of collisions occurring and our blast wall is actually doing its job. It's actually stopping our particles from going through and also our fluid, our explosion effects fluid. That's looking really nice. Now let's swing the camera around. I'm just going to pause it there for a second just to check. And you can see there our explosion is being completely contained by our blast wall. And any particles that kind of come towards here are bouncing off the ground or they are uh, being deflected away from any solid objects. Excellent. Okay, uh, we could let that evolve a little more. Just see it to the point where we actually get the smoke emitting. And you can see it's getting quite close to our, our, our warning sign over here. And that's actually the next thing I want to make interactive in our scene. And you can see now our explosions occurred and our smoke is now forming because obviously the pressure and the, the amount of fuel in those voxels is, is limiting the amount of burning that can occur. We can actually force the burn to happen earlier by going into our explosion effects object and changing some of the burning settings. And in fact, let's just do that now. Let's pause that. Let's go up to the explosion effects object simulation tab and here in the burning section we can actually drop the ignition heat let's drop it to 0.2 let's hit play and we'll see now that the the fluid should ignite with smoke or should start burning a bit earlier and we should see smoke a little earlier as well it also depends of course on all the velocities and things like that so it might be a need to tweak a few things to balance that out but uh, the overall shape of our explosion here is looking great, looking very realistic for the, for the environment that it's in. And that's looking nice. It's looking a bit transparent and we'll deal with the display a little bit later. But first of all, we're going to play with a, uh, some more interaction, some more collision stuff. And there we go, our smoke's coming in and our burning is occurring. Okay, so let's go back to frame zero. And like I said, I want to create some other another level of interactivity. And the really cool thing about exposure effects is that we can advect particles. Now, something that is also uh, uses particles is the cloth solver in X particles. And this object, this banner over here, all along has actually been a cloth simulation. So I'm actually going to turn off our exposure sim for now and turn our banner on. And now when I hit play you'll see that this is actually made of cloth. And so the cool thing about this is, of course, I can actually impart the velocity of our simulation onto this cloth. And so what we do is we want to go back to our explosion, turn it back on, go to the explosion effects object, go to advection, and then we're going to advect the particles. Now I'm going to change our emitter back to that disk because that disk actually fired all of our particles towards this cloth. And so let's go back to frame zero and go to our exposure effects object with the advect particles active. Now, remember, we've got lots of other particles in our scene. We have the ones from our fuse. We have the ones that are actually the emission particles. And I don't want to include those. So I'm going to use groups to make sure that we only advect particles of our cloth group. And there we go. There's a cloth group that's already set up for us. Now, let's hit play. Now, we might need to change the display on our particles here, but on our on our explosion uh, because it might be too dense to, to see the cloth although it is quite transparent at the moment and there we go and now can you see the cloth is getting pushed out it's pillowing out as our explosion comes in and in fact let's go up to the top view or let's pause and actually see and you can see it's getting pushed out it's it's sort of uh, following that explosive motion now of course our explosion is plenty energetic enough to actually damage this cloth and of course we can damage cloth via tearing so if we go to our cloth object and you can see we've got the tearing tab already active and I can activate tearing but I can also tear in a very specific location at, at the moment if I just hit play in fact if I turn our explosion effects back off hit play you'll see our tearing occurs pretty much everywhere because it's all reaching that threshold what I actually want to do is I actually want to add a tear map. So right now, let's go all the way down here and let's add a tear map to our, our cloth mesh. 
and we just need to go into edges mode and you can see we've already selected a tear in fact i'm just going to use i'm going to do that again i'm going to do use uh, oops, u and then m will bring up the path selection tool and that's all i did is i just drew a path you could also cut a path and then just get the edge selection from that cut but i'm just going to create this sort of random tearing that's going on there and then we just need to create a selection tag for that so if you hit m and then i've got a shortcut for that it is set selection i'm going to call that tear oops there we go tear and then drop that into tear and this is where it will actually break now under gravity it might break as well but it's it's it depends on how strong you have your tear strength. Uh, we want another, we obviously want our other velocities to come in and do the tearing. So let's turn our other velocities back on, which is of course our advection and our explosion. So let's have this explosive moment. And now the explosion will reach our cloth, will smash into it. And now it's tearing that cloth. And that's a really cool effect of the fact that you can actually have both of these things interacting like this. And if I pause, we can go around and we can see that it's continuing to advect and we're getting this absolutely excellent looking tearing cloth, all generated from the motion and velocities of our explosure effect solve. Okay, so let's just dial in the settings for our explosion. I want to uh, make sure that it's got a, a bit of a larger explosion that we had in this area, but also one that sort of directs it this way. So let's combine both our sphere and our disk sources, like so. And let's see how that looks. We'll hide the disk source, of course. In fact, we'll hide both of them. There we go, we get our explosion. Are we getting enough going towards our cloth? Maybe not. Oh. It's evolving. There we go, it is hitting our cloth and advecting it, but it's not really enough. So what I might do is I might move our, our disc a little bit to get a slightly different reaction. Or of course we can change the seed on our, um, on our texture, that's another option. But I'm just gonna set up so that we fire them out a little bit further that way. In fact, let's try a different seed in the noise texture. There we go, we'll get a totally different look now. So let's hide those sources, hit play, and let that calculate again. Now, of course, if you're iterating uh, fast like this, you might wanna drop the resolution of your simulation to, to just test stuff out. Wow, look at that, that one's very energetic. There we go, we're hitting our cloth, we're tearing our cloth, and we're also getting our solve being contained by our blast wall. And that's looking really cool. So the last thing I want to do is I just want to change the display of our explosion to make it look really nice in our viewport. And I'm going to pause on a frame. I'm going to let it, I'm going to let it evolve a little bit further because I want to pause on a frame that has a decent amount of smoke in it as well. So if we just let that evolve like so. That is a huge explosion at the moment, looking pretty good. There we go. And of course it's solving all the pressure, all the collisions, all of those sorts of things. There we go. And well, let's just dial in the, the flame at the moment. So let's go to the explosion effects object display. And you'll see we've got the slice count. Now we might want to in increase that. And you can see that that improves the quality of our, because we've got such a large adaptive bounds here, we need to, to divide it up into a certain amount of slices. And I've changed it to 512 to make it smoother. If you drop it down to something like 128, you can really see the, the slices. So 512 is looking nice. And let's dial in the look of our actual fire. And currently it's actually quite hollow in the center. I want it to be quite far, like a, a decent fireball. So I'm actually gonna move this to the right quite a lot and then have that work like that. And then I'm gonna decrease the power here, which will actually bring more reds into our black body gradient here. And there we go, that's looking really nice. Uh, we could even drop the max temperature. That would actually bring even more reds, but that's a bit too low perhaps. So we 3,500, something like that. And then I could actually counteract that with our opacity. So I could increase our opacity again to bring back that brightness. Let's go to three on there. So we get some hot white in there, but that's looking like a very hot, fiery explosion at the moment. There we go. Let's play on a little bit more. Uh, like I said, we could always drop the resolution if we're finding it, uh, if you need to iterate quicker. So jump to the explosion effects object 
And let's change that to say four units. It'll solve quicker. But remember, a lot of the calculations here are actually the pressure because we're, we're doing some extreme pressure addition to our solve. Once those particles are gone, it'll actually solve a lot quicker. But for now, I just want to create more smoke. Another way of creating more smoke, of course, is to actually uh, have our fuel lower than our heat. That will actually create a bit more of an imbalance and it'll, it'll act as if there's more oxygen around in the voxels. But now we're getting this nice smoke anyway, so that's looking cool. Okay, so back to our display tab and let's just dial in our smoke. And you can see right now the smoke color has got a lot of white and grays in it. Let's actually drop that down to a quite a dark value. I want it to be quite a nasty sort of, uh, almost like a gasoline. There we go. And then of course smoke opacity, we could thicken our smoke by increasing our opacity like so. And that's looking pretty good. And there we go. So if I actually just turn our sphere off for a minute and we just focus on that this one explosion, it'll also solve a little bit quicker. Go back to our solver tab, change it to 2.5 again. And let that go. And our explosion will kick off like so. And we get this really hot looking explosion smashing into our, our cloth and then all the smoke evolving and, and arriving behind as well. And that smoke's looking nice and thick. And there we go. So the very, very last thing is that because we are simulating this at a certain voxel size, uh, you might want to increase the detail in that later on. So say we're on a voxel size of three uh, and you're thinking, okay, I've got the shape correct. I've iterated all of this. If you just change the voxel size at that point in the solver, you're actually going to get a different looking simulation. That's just the way that the exposure effect solves works. So if you change voxel size, it can change the look of the sim quite a bit. If you're happy with a specific explosion shape, you can actually utilize up -resing. Now up will utilize the velocities that are generated at that lower resolution and uh, increase the resolution but also uh, just to use the original velocities whilst also adding a few more bits of detail. So let's do that now. Let's put our uh, let's put our cube in there now. Let's try a different shape. And let's drop that down like so. Make sure it's within our There we go. So just trying out some different shapes, see what see what happens. And let's hide that again. Like so. Let's just test that out. There we go. You can see how, how different our explosion actually looks now. And it, the cloth is really getting it. Uh, it's getting destroyed pretty extremely so. So let's actually activate that up -resing. Go into our explosion effects object and activate up -res. Now we'll need to re-simulate. Uh, currently up -res is set to a voxel size of uh, three. So let's drop it down to 2.5. Let's hit play. So now we'll be solving at three, but dropping it down to this, this up res of 2.5. Now I'm not doing it a dramatic amount. And in fact, it's uh, up res works best with sort of uh, when you're not jumping too many voxel sizes. However, this will work quite nicely to add detail and some extra motion. There we go. Let's let it evolve a bit so that we get some of that noisy smoke as well. That's looking great. In fact, in the um, in the source tag of our uh, our emitters here, we could actually um, impart some even more curl and things like that to break up our, our our explosion. We'll do that in a second. But first of all, let's just show the difference between our up res and our our normal res. So we're just going to let that evolve a little bit more. There we go, we're solving all that pressure. You can see this nice black smoke coming in here as well. We're getting a nice mix of the of the fuel and the smoke. Okay, so if I hit pause at that moment, let's go back to the explosion effects object and we can actually toggle this on and off to compare what they look like. So you can see the lower res and then the higher res has a lot more detail. And in fact, it maintains the pressure a little bit more. It maintains the fuel a little bit more. So you get a slightly different looking simulation. But the overall shape, as you can see, is very similar. 
just higher res. So that's up resing. And of course, we could go lower on that voxel size and play around with the extra vorticity and turbulence settings. Uh, I'll let you have a, have a look at those. And like I said, let's change that curl value. Now with particles, you really need to increase the curl value significantly. So I'm going to change it to uh, as high as 500. Let's turn the up res off actually this time. Let's go to our just straight up voxel size of 2.5. And in fact, this would actually be a good time to cache our entire simulation so that we can review it in real time, see the velocity of those particles, you know, the, the extreme velocities that we have here and all the timing and make sure everything's looking good. So let's just check the fuse on our cannonball. Let's have the fuse start at frame 30. Let's have the fuse last for 30 frames and then our explosion can evolve from that point. Let's just check those with the particles. And that's going to start it. There we go. Ignites at frame 30. And then by 60, we detonate. Boom. Got all our particles, our trails moving as well. So we'll hide those. We will cache them, but we'll hide those. And then our explosion effects, of course, needs to be on. Let's leave that on. And then we're going to add a, a, an XP cache at the top of our hierarchy. I want it to cache everything, including the the particles in our cannonball, the cloth sim, all of it. I want it to be cached. So I'm going to go to X particles, XP cache, and you'll see we have our cache options. I'm going to turn compress cache on build because I, I have enough hard disk space and that can take some time to compress the frames. And then I'm just going to simply hit build cache and we'll come back when that's calculated. Okay, and there we have it. Our objects have been cached. And if we look down the bottom here, we can see that on this frame in particular, we have a decent amount of elements, uh, millions of, of elements here. Uh, we have a total disk space used of 10.3 gig. And then our time to complete was eight minutes and basically 35 seconds. Okay, so now it's all cached. We can actually review it in a, in a faster manner. And you'll see our explosion is a really rapid expansion of these gases. And then you'll see it develop and we'll get all of this smoke and these plumes and this really beautiful looking explosion simulation. And of course, we have our cloth, our poor cloth getting absolutely decimated. And then it's being advected. In fact, it's being carried up by the advection there. So it's hot enough that it's creating an upward thrust. There we go, smashing through our cloth. It's enveloping it. And then in fact, if we hide our explosion, it's actually lifting our cloth up because of the advection there. So this is a really great way of integrating objects into your scene, of course. And there we have it, our exposure effects system to create explosions. So we're utilizing particles and exposure effects source tags to impart all of that pressure and that velocity, that huge energy that we get from these explosions. And we've, we've used that to time it with our fused cannonball as well. And obviously being able to rig that with Espresso is really useful. And we have a very controllable and shapeable explosion effects explosion rig.